question. So the first thing I want to uh, talk about is just what's coming. So this is our syllabus for the last couple of classes. Today we're going to cover chapter 10 and meiosis. Um, then on Thursday we'll cover genetics and um, probably it'll, it'll flow into next Tuesday. I really love genetics and I hate cutting it short. We probably won't cover very much of chapter 12. I'm just going to highlight a little bit and I'm going to use this time to really get in as much of the genetics as I can. Um, then next Thursday, uh, I'm sorry, so this date must be wrong. Hold on, let me look on my phone. I just realized one of those dates is wrong. Um, Oh, okay, so this says April 27th, but that should really say April 28th. I'll change it right now. Um, so next Thursday will be the last possible day for you to turn in your genetics disease project and your um, vocab project. Otherwise, I just won't have enough time to grade it and get it all done. So this should really say the 28th. All right. Dr. Bird, did you say Thursday? Uh, let's see, what did I say? What's on here? No, I, next um, Thursday. Uh, no, that's the Wednesday, next Wednesday. So before the final. I want you to try to get it done before you take the final. So this is today, April 21st. April 23rd is Thursday of this week. The next Tuesday is April 28th. Then have everything due to into me by the 29th. And then the final is scheduled for either April 30th or May 4th. And I really don't care, um, like Tuesday, Thursday, people, if you want the whole weekend to study, I personally don't love the idea of Thursday finals when you have class on Tuesday. Um, and I have made that very clear to TCC people. Uh, I don't think it's fair. I mean, for example, our class, um, the Monday, Wednesday class is getting a whole weekend to study that you're not getting, and I just think it's unfair. The only d issue is if you have another final on Monday at 1230, then you can't take my final at 1230 because you already have another final at that time. Um, if that really is an issue for someone and you really feel like you need the weekend, um, let me know. I'll, of course, figure out a time that will work for you. But um, but this is the way it's scheduled, and I have to offer the final um, at these times. I can't offer it any other time for the whole class. That's, I'm not allowed to do that. I have no work. So what is the time limit on the final? It's going to be, It's. I think it's three hours or two hours and 50 minutes or something like that. It's what you would normally get if you were in class. So it's going to be 100 questions, 100 multiple choice questions. Um, or so. I, I haven't figured out the exact number yet, but around 100 multiple choice questions. And then um, you'll get from 1230 to like 230 or 3 o'clock, something like that, whatever the original uh, final exam schedule states. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But you're only going to get one chance on this test. You won't get multiple chances because you probably have more than a minute per question. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And don't forget that your final exam score is going to um, count. If it's higher than another exam score, that other exam score will take the final exam score. And something to just keep in mind is I don't actually replace the score in the grade book. Uh, so what I do is I have, to, I have to make Blackboard do what I want it to do, and there's not an option to do this replacement. So I would have to go in there and manually replace every grade. I just think that's a room for error on my part. So what I do is I list the first four exams and then I list the final exam twice. And then I just tell the system to look, drop the lowest grade. So if, if exam two was your lowest grade, it'll just drop exam two, but then it'll count the final twice. If your final is the lowest exam, it will drop one of the finals and it'll just count all the exams as they are. So don't go into the grade book and think, oh my gosh, she didn't do it. I, I got a higher grade on the final, but she didn't actually replace the grade. You won't see it happen in the grade book. Check. Wait, uh, I just want to make sure I heard right. You said if the final is our worst grade, then the final gets dropped. Uh, no, 
No, if your final is your worst grade, then um, no exams get dropped. Oh, okay, I see. If your final beats any of the lower grades, then it replaces, and the final basically counts twice. Does that make sense? I promise it works. <laughs> you said the final counts twice if something gets dropped, or, or no? I see you're saying if something does get dropped, it counts twice. Yes, it exactly. replaces it's going to replace that. Exactly. So wait, I just saw a check come in. Should it just won't count twice? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, all right. So. Tuesday, Thursday, people, you are the ones I need to hear from. If you're not going to take it on Thursday of next week, I need to have a commitment from you that you don't have another final on Monday at 1230. Okay, so, oh, you know what? I just realized that's wrong. Right? Because Monday, Wednesday section, you guys are a 930 section, right? I got to change that too. Hold on. Let me change that. So Monday, Wednesday, people, you're going to take the final at 930. I have to stick with the final schedule. I'm not allowed to change it. So that's why I keep making these changes. And we've been meeting at 1230. So I have that in my head, but that's not really true. We are 930. So Tuesday, Thursday, people, you're the ones I need to hear from. Monday, Wednesday, people, you won't have another final during that time. It just That's just the way finals work. You shouldn't have one. Okay, so that's just what's to come. Any questions? This is it. We have just a couple classes left. All right, so um, we are going to start. Oh, and then the other thing I didn't say, um, I think I said it before recording, is that I've graded, I've graded a, um, as much as I can in both my sections, um, vocab projects that have come in. I still have a couple of discussion questions in my Tuesday, Thursday section that I haven't finished. My goal is to get them to, um, uh, finished before the drop date because Thursday is the drop date. So we'll meet again on Thursday and we can talk about that. Um, so just so you know, that's all coming and I'm working hard to get all that graded. Um, Kiara, yes, it's going to be a pool of questions. So you won't if you if you're taking it next to your neighbor, you won't necessarily have the same questions that they have. Um, do we need to take email you if you need to take it on Monday? Yes, please. Tuesday, Thursday, people, if you intend to take it on Monday and I need you to email me and say. Cause so if someone comes back to me, I can I have proof that you told me that you don't have another final at that time. So say because I don't have another final on Monday at 930, I'd like to take the final then and that's fine. Um, what percent does the final hold if it's counting only as one test? So if it doesn't replace a lower test, it's just equal to all the other tests. Um, we can pass the exam on Monday because I have an exam on Thursday. Uh, one I don't understand what you're asking me, Camille. Your test is already on Monday. So you don't have to worry about it. You're in my Monday oh, section. Okay, just asking because I have another exam on Thursday. That's why I, I told you if right. I can do it on Monday. Yeah, you're already scheduled for Monday, so that's not a problem for your class. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the suspense date for giving you notice of what day we want to take it? Oh, um, just by next Thursday. By next Thursday. Yeah, so you can wait. I mean, no, you can even wait till I would let me know before Thursday. Um, just because you're you're gonna know by Thursday at 12:30 whether you want to take it at 12:30 on Thursday or not, <laughs> right? That makes sense, Chet. Okay. Did someone else have a question? Did I see a hand raised or something? Maybe someone just came in. Yeah, I know. I'm 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 sorry, and I kept making mistakes on this new schedule, so I apologize too because I kept getting the days and the times wrong. So I think this is the final version right here. And this is in uh, Blackboard, so you'll have this updated. OK, so keep checking your grade book. Um, if you have questions about your grade, email me. Get as much turned in as you can. Remember, the vocab project, those of you that have completed it, I just can't imagine that it's not helping you study for the final. So um, it, use that as a way to study for the final. OK, so make sure you get that vocab project done. Mohab, yes. Mohab, can you hear me? 
You might be muted. Yeah, hi, doctor. I'm just typing. Oh, you're typing. So, doc, I want to ask you about the genetic uh, disease project. When is it due? It's due, as you can see on the screen right here, on next Wednesday, April 29th. Sure, thank you. Ivan, did you have a question? So the post lecture quizzes are seven point five percent of lecture grade. Yes. Um, just the Blackboard quizzes all together, not just the post ones. So okay. So all quizzes. All Blackboard quizzes are seven point five. So that's the pre, the video, and the post together. Okay. And then the so post lecture. Be... The post lecture quizzes just need to be done by the day you take the final. Um, okay. Because. You know, they're going to help you study, so I'm trying to encourage you to do them beforehand. The okay. in-class quizzes are worth 7.5%. We didn't have very many of those, um, you know, because we kind of stopped it halfway through the semester. Um, it's a real bummer because I kind of like my in-class quizzes on the second half of the semester almost better. But um, they will also be worth 7, 5, uh, an additional separate category of 7.5% of your grade. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's get started on meiosis. And um, so these are your learning objectives uh, for meiosis. This is your study guide. So some of you have asked me, like, am I going to give you a study guide for the final? You have a study guide for every chapter that's in your learning objectives. And then you also have the practice tests for every chapter or every exam that you can retake to practice um, the material. You can also take, um, um, you can look back at your pre-lab quizzes and things like that to study. So make, or I'm sorry, the post-lab quizzes, if you haven't, a lot of you haven't taken those yet. So those are a great way to kind of go in and see where your gaps are. All right, now when it comes to meiosis, um, it's a really, it's like one of these crux points in learning biology. Uh, it very much depends upon how well you know mitosis. So you have to kind of remember to bring back what we learned about mitosis, PP mat, and the whole idea of the chromosomes having to condense so that they can be organized and then separated um, in a really reliable, accurate way, right? So that has to still be in your brain because we're really going to be using that same um, mechanism to do meiosis. But we have to master meiosis because that helps us understand how genetics works. And genetics is really like the culmination of the central dogma and meiosis and protein expression and secretory pathway and all those other things we learn. We're really going to start to kind of see how it all fits together when we get to genetics. So we're really starting to put all the pieces together. So keep that in mind as we're going through this, that you want to be thinking about mitosis and think about how they're different and how they're the same. And then when we get to the next chapter, really putting all of these things together. Okay, so we've talked about how reproduction works. You can reproduce one of two ways. You can reproduce asexually. Um, this creates offspring that are identical to the parents. And you only need one parent. So you have one parent cell that becomes two daughter cells, just like we saw with mitosis. And then there's sexual reproduction, where the offspring are not identical to the parent. In fact, they're unique compared to the parent. And this involves two parents coming together to make one individual. All right. So when we think about cell division, we have to think about asexual reproduction being completed either by mitosis or binary fission, one parent into two offspring. Sexual reproduction means you have to have two parents, a sperm and an egg, that come together to make one genetically unique offspring. In order to make the to, uh, sperm and the egg, you do meiosis and then fertilization. So really, sexual reproduction has two steps in it. It's meiosis plus fertilization to get to the new organism. Now. Um, with asexual reproduction, you end up with identical offspring. So your traits are going to be uh, nearly identical every single time without the you know, chance of, of random errors. In sexual reproduction, every single time you get offspring that are genetically unique. 
genetically different from each other. Um, so we're going to focus on how do we get this genetic variability. So we're going to see that there's this kind of scrambling of chromosomes during just the production of sperm and egg. And then we don't know what sperm is going to get fertilized, what sperm is going to fertilize what egg. And so that's another uh, way to introduce variation. But all of that, taking the energy to mix around the chromosomes and to find mates, co is costly to the cell. The cell or the organism has to actually go out into the wild, find a mate, risk being seen by a predator. Um, it has to make sure it has enough food in its system to actually have energy to do this. So it seems a little bit like sexual reproduction would be unfavorable. It's timely, it's costly. So why would organisms want to go through this um, pathway? Does anyone want to offer an explanation? Ivan? Um, natural selection that all like offspring are going to be genetically diverse from each other. Therefore, they might have like a better survival chance. Perfect. That's exactly right. Okay. So in genetic, um, in meiosis, we're going to result in genetic diversity. And remember, we didn't, we haven't talked that much about evolution. We did it very little at the beginning of chapter one. And then we haven't really talked about it. You'll get it a lot of chance to talk about it in 1407. But the idea that the environment is what really dictates the traits that are most suitable to pass on to the next generation. So you can imagine if everybody kind of had the same traits like you see in this graph right here, right? If everybody was kind of the same and then there was some huge change in the environment, then everybody would die off if that change didn't suit the, that trait. However, if you have diversity, then what happens is you have the disaster or a change in the environment where people actually do get through and get past whatever that change in the environment is. So these variations, which really are differences in DNA sequence, right? So differences in DNA sequence are the fodder for the different traits that you have because they make different proteins and then that's what allows natural selection to act on it all right so seth you said genetic variation gives stronger offspring and and that's one of those careful words to use stronger is only um, from the perspective of the environment so sometimes it's good to be little and inconspicuous and not good to be big and out there right although sometimes it might be really great to be big and you know just you know pop tower over the individual next to you so yes better suited is probably um, a better way of saying it than stronger because when we think stronger we think like muscular like you know is Arnold Schwarzenegger really a better than you know I don't know I'm trying to think of someone little um, I can't think <laughs> someone who's not very big, right? Um, and not necessarily, right? Because that could be Danny Jackie DeVito. Can't. Danny DeVito, there you go. Is is he really better off? I don't I don't know, right? Because it just depends on the environment. Like for example, right now we have a new environmental pressure on us, right? We have this new um, virus that is attacking certain subsets of people more than other subsets of people, and so. You know, in this case, it would be whatever. I mean, maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger is really, really big, but has a heart condition. Danny DeVito is tiny, but doesn't have one. So if they both get COVID-19, even though Arnold's bigger and stronger, he might be the one that dies. Do you see what I'm saying? So it doesn't it's not about being stronger. Um, I saw this really funny post that said um, something like. If you don't like the quarantine, then just go out. <laughs> natural selection at its best, right? So, you know, because you're taking the chance if you don't stay in that you could be someone that has, I mean, you may not even know you have an underlying condition that could be dangerous in this. And the people that have those conditions, if they're young, especially if they're your age, they're not going to pass it on because if you get it now and it's and it kills you, you're not going to be old enough to, you're not going to have had a chance to pass it on to the next generation. So that is natural selection at its best. 
Okay. So let's look at this question. Which below is false? I hate questions like this. Um, obviously, I didn't write this question. It was built in here. Um, asexual reproduction is primarily used by prokaryotes. Is that true or false? Well, it is true in the sense that prokaryotes do asexual reproduction, but remember, every cell in our body does asexual reproduction all the time too, right? So our cells are doing asexual reproduction primarily as well. Um, asexual reproduction is relatively new. False. That's false for sure. Um, sexual reproduction generates diversity. That's true. true. And sexual reproduction requires a lot of energy compared to asexual. That's true. So asex that A is true, but I don't really like that. I would say prokaryotes primarily use asexual reproduction. That would be a better way of stating that because our cells do um, asexual reproduction as well. Okay, so we need to talk a little bit about the vocabulary before we get started. So the word soma means body. So somatic cells are your body cells. Um, and these cells, every cell in our body has a complete set of chromosomes, all right? So if we were to take a cell and pull out the chromosomes and, and color code them, let's just say per kind, right? We would find that we have two of every kind of chromosome. Now remember, we talked about how do we know what a kind is. The kinds of chromosomes are determined by the length of the chromosome where the centromere position is, and then the genes that are found along it are in the same location, all right? So for example, this is the chromosome one, maybe that this person got from their mom. This is the chromosome one that they got from their dad, all right? Notice they're the same length, they have the same centromere position, and if we were to go in and look, maybe there would be the gene for hair color on this one, and there would be the gene for hair color on that one, all right? Um, and we could do that with every single pair. So remember, we have them in pairs, for every kind. We get one of the pair from our mom and one of the pair from our dad, all right? And really, all of us look just like this. If I were to pull my chromosome one out and pull, I'm just picking Cyrus's chromosome one out, it would be the same length with the same centromere position, same genes on it. So as humans, our chromosome ones are, are always about exactly the same unless you have some major mutation all right now this picture that you're looking at right here is called a karyotype oops all right so this is um, a more um, not as fancy version of it you can see here that there this is a duplicated um, karyotype each chromosome is duplicated so you can see the one copy and then the other copy and they have these very characteristic banding patterns where there are regions where it's more condensed they're still heterochromatic as a whole, but there are some regions of the chromosome that are still even more condensed than others, all right? So very easily, if you were to take a cell that's in mitosis, where the chromosomes are condensed, you could very easily pull out the chromosomes and align them in this way to get this picture of what the chromosomes look like. So this is called a karyotype. Now we have 23 kinds, okay? The first 22 kinds are called autosomes. Everybody has these. The last pair are called the sex chromosomes, and they differ between males and females. All right? So autosomes are every male and female have the pair of chromosome ones, and they have a pair of chromosome twos, and they have a pair of chromosome threes. Sex chromosomes are a little bit different because in females, we have a pair of Xs, but in males, you have an X and a Y, all right? So if we were to look at that karyotype, in females, it looks like this, and in males, it looks like this. So you can use these karyotypes to actually determine sex. Now I'm gonna go back a slide because I skipped one. Now these pairs of chromosomes are called homologous chromosomes. So we haven't used that word yet. Um, the word homologous suggests that they came from a common ancestor. Um, so if you have homologous structures between organisms, so say, for example, um, a bat wing and a human arm have homologous bone structure. Remember the one bone, two bone, lots of bone, finger bones, right? Those are, they came from a common ancestor. Um, analogous 
would mean they didn't come from a common ancestor. So they look alike now, but they just independently arose not from a common ancestor. So these are homologous chromosomes. This would be the chromosome from mom, and this would be your chromosome from dad, right? Now, in this case, these are both already duplicated, all right? So that means they have already gone through S phase and DNA replication. So we've already generated the duplicated chromosome that is made up of two identical sister chromatids connected here at the centromere. So the homologous chromosomes can be duplicated or unduplicated, it doesn't matter. Just remember that the one from mom is not identical to the one from dad. They are the same length. They do have the same genes in the same location, but they are not identical. Let's just say this orange stripe is eye color, right? Well, my dad has very dark brown eyes. My mom has green eyes, so they can't be identical, right? So they're the same gene, they're the gene for eye color, but they're different versions of the same gene. So um, I think I have a good question here. Oh, let me do this first. So then we also have um, a little bit of vocabulary, the position along the chromosome, so the location along the chromosome where the genes are, are called the loci. So you would have, um, a locus for gene for eye color on this chromosome in the same position as uh, the gene for eye color here on the homologous chromosome. And then the difference between these genes, right, is really just a difference in DNA sequence, right? If dad has brown eyes and mom has green eyes, mom has a different DNA sequence than dad that made for a different protein, right? And so those different versions of the genes are called alleles, and we're going to get into those in the next chapter, but I want you to be aware of those words. So if we were to look at, here's my chromosome from mom, here's my chromosome from dad, at position A here, where gene A is, maybe mom and dad do have the same color, same uh, version of the gene, same sequence, but here at gene B, Dad has, or mom has a different version than dad does. They have a different DNA sequence there, but it's still the same gene. Okay, so let's ask ourselves these questions. Are homologous chromosomes identical? Yes. Is he right? No, no they're not identical, because where do homologous chromosomes come from? Mom and dad. That's right. Mom and dad give you the homologous chromosomes. So they can't be identical because mom and dad aren't identical, right? Um, however, our, the sister chromatids, let's just say we're talking just about the chromosome from mom, are the sister chromat chromatids from the chromosome from mom identical? Yes. Now those are identical because remember, sister chromatids are the result of what? Where did they come from? Where did these identical copies come from? Go ahead. Mitosis. Well, before mitosis, what process leads to sister chromatids? Okay, it's during interphase, that's right. So what part of interphase? S phase, what happens during S phase? DNA replication. DNA replication, that was the word I was looking for. So sister chromatids, are a result of DNA replication. And we know that DNA replication, the job of it is to make an identical copy, right? And when they do, they put them in that X form and they make the sister chromatids. Everybody remember that? So in mom chromosome, the two sister chromatids are identical. In dad's chromosome, the two sister chromatids are identical. But if you're comparing mom to dad, mom and dad aren't identical. They are homologous, which means they're the same length with the same centromere position, the same genes in the same location, but the DNA sequence is not identical. Got it? Yeah, no, maybe so. Okay, so let's look at this. How many sister chromatids are there in one pair of unduplicated homologous chromosomes? Whew, that's a lot of vocabulary, so take your time and read it. One pair of unduplicated homologous chromosomes. Good, good job. Zero, because when they're unduplicated, we haven't made any sister chromatids yet. So excellent. So the answer to that one is zero. 
All right, what about in a pair of duplicated chromosomes? Four. That's right, four, that's right, good job. Four, because two from mom and two from dad, right? What about a single duplicated chromosome? So maybe just the one from mom? Two. And that would be two, good, all right? So make sure you kind of see how that works. So if in humans we have 46 chromosomes, how many homologous pairs does that represent? Okay, 23, but this is a little bit of a trick question because what does that really depend on? Right, depends on your sex. So for, for, for Elaine who answered that, it should be 23, but Juan it should be 22. Because for females, your, your last pair is truly a homologous pair, but in males, it is not, right? That XY is not truly homologous. They are not the same length, and uh, they don't have the same centripetal position, and they don't have all the same genes. Excellent. All right, so now we're going to put this whole idea um, into perspective in terms of a sexual reproductive life cycle. So we're going to start right here with this uh, diploid zygote. So uh, we haven't defined this word yet, but basically this is a cell that has 46 chromosomes. All right. This is the moment of conception. So you were just conceived. Mom and dad came together and made you. All right. From that one cell, your that cell undergoes trillions and trillions and trillions of rounds of mitosis to get to be the adult body that you have right now, all right? It just continually undergoes mitosis. Every cell as a result is genetically identical to that original cell that your mom and dad gave you when you were conceived, all right? Barring any random mutations that happen along the way, right? Because that can happen. But for the most part, every single cell in your body is genetically identical to every other cell in your body and to that original cell that developed when you were conceived, except the cells in your gonads. So in females, that's in your ovaries, and guys, that's in your testes. Those cells undergo another process called meiosis to generate eggs in females and sperm in males. And meiosis is a process that reduces the chromosome number. So in sperm and egg, instead of having 46 chromosomes, they only have 23 chromosomes, all right? So that when the sperm fertilizes the egg during fertilization, we go back to the regular number that we're supposed to have. So our, our chromosome number as humans is always 46. And when you get off from 46, you kind of start to have problems, all right? So we're going to talk about what that is later. So in order for sexual reproduction to take place, we have to first reduce that chromosome number down so that egg has 23 and the sperm has 23, so that when we unite them, we're back to that 46 number. So meiosis and fertilization allow for that sexual reproductive part of this pathway to take place. The bulk of our cell divisions are still asexual right? All of our skin cells and, and liver cells and heart cells, those are all made in an asexual way, right? And on your last test, you had to talk about, well, how are they so different? How are the cells so different if they all have exactly the same DNA? And it comes down to differential gene expression. So we talked about all of those different ways we can regulate what proteins are going to be expressed, starting with heterochromatin and going the whole way to post-translational modifications and localization of the protein, that is what causes the cells to be different, which proteins are actually being made and functioning in the cells. So not all proteins are made in every single cell. Okay, now the words haploid different versus diploid. Dip, the word ploidy means um, number of chromosomes or kind of chromosomes. So di means two. So that means in a diploid cell, you have two of every kind of chromosome. All right. So our somatic cells, which we already talked about, our skin cells and our heart cells and our, our liver cells, all have 
two of every chromosome, just like we saw in those karyotypes. Our gametes, which are just in females, that's your eggs, and in males, that's your sperm. Those are the only cells of your whole body that only have one copy of every chromosome called haploid. Ooh, somebody fell, are you okay, whoever that was? <laughs> it sounded bad. Um, you only have one of every chromosome, which means you have one chromosome one and one chromosome two and one chromosome three, and you only have one sex chromosome in your egg or your sperm, right? Now, if you're an egg, what's the sex chromosome you're going to have? It's going to be X, right? You only have X to give. If you're an, a sperm, you can have one sperm that has an X and another sperm that has a Y, right? Because you can give one or the other. And so we'll talk about how that works. So meiosis is the process that we use to make these haploid cells. So basically, the definition of meiosis is to convert a diploid cell into a haploid cell, right? And then fertilization brings that number back to the right diploid number that it's supposed to be. Okay. Any questions on just this general picture? Um, you definitely should know diploid versus haploid. And we'll, we're going to go through some more examples here in a second so you can practice should know the definition of meiosis, why fertilization is important. Um, the word gamete just refers to our sex cells, either, either egg or sperm. Um, and then you should know somatic cells as well. And not that I'm going to ask you vocab questions, but those will be vocabulary used in questions that I want to make sure you can answer. Ivan, yes. So, um... For meiosis to happen, it's you said it's like 23 chromosomes goes to each like sperm cell if it's in a man or so like uh -huh. it would make two sperm cells for every uh, di diploid cell. It actually makes four, so we'll see it in a second why. But for every diploid cell that's like a, a precursor cell to sperm, it's going to make four sperm. Oh, okay. And or potential eggs. You'll see why in just a second, because we actually go through PPMAT twice. Oh, okay. All right. So, like I said, it's important for us to kind of have already a solid understanding of mitosis. So, hopefully, you kind of can visualize in your head the steps of PPMAT and why PPMAT had to happen. Um, and so, I really think it's important to, if, if you have a solid understanding of that, to just focus on the differences between mitosis and meiosis. I'm not sure why this isn't moving forward. Okay, like mitosis, meiosis um, starts through, uh, I hate to use the word preceded, is preceded by interface. So basically, we're gonna have a new cell be born, it's gonna go into G1, it's gonna undergo S, and then G2 before it commits to meiosis. So that means the chromosomes are going to duplicate. So you might think, well, why wouldn't we just take 46 unduplicated chromosomes and just put 23 here and 23 there? Well, that's not what the cell does. So the cell takes the, the, the 46 chromosomes, duplicates it. So now we have 92 copies, and then has to separate those out into these individual cells. So that's why we end up with four cells, because we need half the number of chromosomes. But before we start, we actually get to 92 copies. All right. So meiosis goes through PPMAT twice. So we call the first PPMAT meiosis one and the second PPMAT meiosis two. All right. During meiosis one, instead of having, remember what we did in mitosis, we would we would get them all lined up and then we would separate the sister chromatids during anaphase. Instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to separate the homologous chromosomes during anaphase. So we're going to separate the mom chromosome from the dad chromosome and the, the sister chromatids are going to stay intact. And then we're going to go through PPMAT again to now take the mom chromosome and separate the sister chromatids from each other. All right. So we're going to end up with four cells in the end. All right, so let's look at what that looks like. Oh, just to remind you, our stages of mitosis. 
we start, remember in G2, we are getting prepared. We've already duplicated the chromosomes. We're duplicating the centrosomes. We go into prophase. The centrosomes start to form the spindle. The chromosomes start to condense. We get to prometaphase. The nuclear envelope goes away. The microtubules attach to the centromeres of the chromosomes. They tug a war. We finally get them all in the middle. That's metaphase. They line up in a single file line, right? And then in anaphase, we separate the sister chromatids out. And then telophase, we get the two identical cells that look like the original starting cell. All right, so those things are going to happen in the same way. We're just going to add some additional things that are happening on top of that. So the, the general gist of these stages is no different. All you have to do is focus on the couple things that are different. So during meiosis one, do all the moms go together and all the dads go together? No, not necessarily. So that's another thing that leads to genetic variation. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. OK. All right. So again, the meiosis's job is to cut the chromosome number in half and to introduce variation. So in meiosis, we get half the number of chromosomes. We get more genetic vari variation. We get four cells instead of two, and we really are going to work to shuffle some genetic information around. All right, so let's look at this. I love this picture. Um, I think this is a great picture to use when you're studying. In fact, if I were you, when I was taking the final, if I had a printer, I would probably print this picture out and have it next to me because it really helps you visualize what's going on. Okay, so the starting cell on the left, this one right here, it's labeled here as diploid. But if I asked you to prove it, how would you prove to me that that cell is diploid? This one right here. How do you know that this cell is diploid? Because it has all the pairs of chromosomes. OK, tell me what you mean by all the pairs. Um. OK, two homologous pairs, two sets. So how do we know that it's not how do we know there's two sets? How do we know there's just not four random ones? How do you know that they're sets? How do you know they're homologous? Because of their length and centromeres. Good. So too long, right, and too short. And they're color-coded. Why are they color-coded this way? Because the two that are the same length aren't the same color. So are those, are those two the homologous chromosomes, or are the two blue ones the homologous chromosomes? No, that the opposite colors are the homologous right. right. colors. So the blue one represents that chrom long chromosome from dad, and the pink one represents that chromosome from mom. Okay, good. Excellent. So, um, so when we're looking at a cell like this, we would say this is a diploid cell, right? So we would call it 2N. So what is the chromosome number for this cell? 2N equals what? Just like I said, in humans, we are 2n equals 46. This is 2n equals 4. Good, right? Because so, our kinds of chromosome, which is what n equals, is 2. Right? We have one long and one short. All right, now tell me, looking at this same cell, what, what phase of the cell cycle might we be? And then pay attention to the arrows over here. What, where are we in the cell cycle in this cell right here? OK, we're in interphase. End of G what, Seth? G1 or G2? G2. So we have we already completed S? Yeah, how, what's your evidence that S has been completed? The chromosomes are duplicated. That's exactly right. All right, so those are the things I want you to do when you're looking at questions about meiosis. Figure out where you are before you start. Now, what we're going to do in meiosis is we're going to go through PPMAT twice. The first time we go through PPMAT, what we're going to focus on are separating the homologous chromosomes from each other. So we're going to take this dad homologous chromosome, the long one, the whole thing, the duplicated thing and all, and put it in this cell. And we're going to take the mum version and put it in this cell. And we're going to do the same thing with the short one. We're going to take the dad one and put it in this cell. 
and the mom wanted witness though. So Seth, that shows you that the mums all don't go the same way. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second. All right. Now, these cells are labeled haploid. Is that true? Are they really haploid? No. You think they're not? So how would you prove that they're diploid then? Because they both, um, they, the, chromos the chromosomes have each other's pairs. All right, but we're remember, is a duplicated chromosome one chromosome or two? Two. No, nope. when it's duplicated and they're connected, it's just one. So chances are that labeling is right, that they are haploid. So how are you going to prove it? How would you prove that that's haploid? How would you know by looking at it? Anybody? Since they're well, yeah. go ahead. Individually, when you add them together, it's one set. Right. So you only have two total chromosomes, right? And you luckily have one long and one short. So you have two, one of each kind, right? So by the end of meiosis one, the cells are already haploid. So you might think, well, then we're done. However, the chromosomes are still duplicated. And we can't have that happen because then we'd still end up with the wrong number of copies after fertilization. So this is why we have to go through meiosis two, and each cell goes through PPMET independently of each other. And now in meiosis two, instead of separating homologous chromosomes, we're actually going to separate the sister chromatids, just like we did in mitosis. So we're going to take this sister chromatid from this dad chromosome and put it here and the other sister chromatid and put it here. And remember, as soon as they separate, they become unduplicated chromosomes. And then we're going to do the same here. The mom short one goes here and the mom short one goes there. And then the same here. The long short mom goes there. The long mom goes there. The dad short one goes there. The dad short one goes there. Are these cells still haploid? Yeah, they still have only one set of chromosomes, one long and one short. But now we've resolved the issue of them being duplicated. They're no longer duplicated chromosomes. And notice they're not all identical. This one has a long chromosome from dad, and this one has a long chromosome from mom. So, and remember, mom and dad aren't identical. So you know those two, two cells cannot be identical to each other. All right, so again, I, I recommend when you're studying to have this kind of printed sitting next to you it really once you start to learn this this is just the best way to look at it is in a, in a flow chart like this all right where it's labeled hap haploid and diploid um the top and second one are not identical either then um as shown in this picture they are right because remember these two sister chromatids on this big long blue chromosome are they identical or not Yes, and these two pink sister chromatids are identical or not? Yes, they're identical too. So when we take one identical copy here, one identical copy here, and put it here, and the same there, technically these two cells, as they're shown in this picture, are identical. Now we're going to find out that that's not always the case, and we'll find out why. But as it's shown in this picture, yes, the top one and the second one are identical and the bottom two are identical as well. Okay, so here's where what we're going to do now. We're going to go into meiosis one and we're going to go through PPMAT. So every stage now is going to be have a one after it. Prophase one, prometaphase one, metaphase one, anaphase one. So on the test, this is just a really important like kind of vocabulary thing to know. If it says prophase one, that's always referring to meiosis one. If it says prophase two, that's always going to be referring to meiosis two. If it just says prophase, that's mitosis. So you have to pay attention to the one, two, or lack of that number. Everybody get that? All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to walk through meiosis one and meiosis two, every step, the whole PP mat, the whole way through. And we're going to focus on 
the differences from mitosis, all right? And let me tell you that the major differences happen during meiosis one. Meiosis two is nearly identical to mitosis. Meiosis one is where we have a lot, a lot, a lot of differences. Okay, so let's start with meiosis one. Our first phase is prophase one, all right? And right away in prophase one, things change, all right? So in prophase one, immediately the homologous chromosomes find each other. So think of it like a big twin convention, right? And everybody's mingling around and they say, everybody find your twin, right? And maybe it's like a fraternal twin convention. So everybody goes and they find their fraternal twin, okay? That process of finding each other is called synapsis. All right, so that's the first thing that has to happen. The homologous chromosomes find each other via synapsis. All right, now once they're together, they look kind of like this four-legged creature right here, and they're called a tetrad, all right? So tetrad means four, right? So it looks like they have four legs. And they kind of don't just stand next to each other. They, they snuggle. They really get intertwined with each other. Whereas where these inner chromatids, so the mum inner chromatid and the dad inner chromatid here, they tangle with each other. And at some point in that tangling, they actually break and exchange material with each other. This is called crossing over. So when that happens, the resulting chromosomes look something like this, right? This sister chromatid from dad is unchanged. However, this sister chromatid is, has a foot here that looks like mom. This sister chromatid from mom is unchanged, but this sister chromatid from mom has a foot here that looks like dad. So can you see how that would introduce a little bit of genetic variation? So let's just say on um, this chromosome right here, we have, or along here on these homologous chromosomes, we have eye color. And then down here, we have a gene for freckles. All right, so you would think, okay, here's this, dad has green eyes and freckles. Mom has brown eyes and no freckles. All right, so if, if you come down here and you look, Green eyes and freckles are still going to go together on this sister chromatid. Think back to this picture, right? Green eyes and freckles here. However, if one of the cells inherits this version, which is no longer identical, so we lose our identical here, right? This kid, if they get this chromosome, they're going to get the green eyes gene, but not the freckle gene, right? So they're going to have green eyes and no freckles. Whereas this kid over here is going to get brown eyes and freckles. So this is a way of kind of shuffling these traits around where you get these interesting combinations that don't look like either parent altogether. All right. So this happened in my kids. I have green eyes and freckles. My husband has blue eyes and no freckles. We have two kids. One kid has green eyes, but no freckles. The other kid has blue eyes and freckles. So it could have been a crossing over event that, that allowed those changes to happen. Kind of cool, right? All right, this all happens during prophase one. So all the other parts of prophase one still happen. The chromosomes still condense, the centrosomes are still moving, but while that's all happening, the chromosomes, homologous chromosomes are finding each other. What's that called again? What's it called when the homologous chromosomes find each other? Synapsis. And then they, they stay in their tetrad and they snuggle and they start to exchange material with each other. And that's called crossing over. So that part is very, very different than mitosis. Everybody see how that's different? Yes. Okay. So let's just kind of look at it. The homologous chromosomes are going to find each other, that synapsis, right? And they're going to form that tetrad. So the four-legged sister chromatid thing. All right, and then they're going to cross over. 
they're going to snuggle, they're going to break, and they're going to exchange. And now you have this now shuffling of traits that you didn't have before. All right. That introduces some even more variation than just having a random fertilized egg and sperm. All right, now we go into prometaphase one. So normally prometaphase one, the, the microtubules attach to the chromosome at the centromere, right? And then they do that little tug of war. Well, now we're tangled up in this tetrad. So we can't really attach easily here and here. So what happens is we're going to attach on the outsides of the tetrad, all right? So the, the pairs stay together, and the, chroma, the microtubules attach on the outside of the tetrad. Everybody see how that works? And that's different, right? We didn't have tetrads in mitosis, and we just made sure we were attached to either side of every single chromosome. Now we're going to make sure we're attached to either side of every single tetrad. So they stay in their pairs during prometaphase one. Does anyone want to guess when do the pair separate? Nobody wants to guess. When does separation uh, happen? Uh, metaphase two. Nope. Anaphase? Anaphase one, right? In anaphase one. So we'll get there in a minute. I was just kind of pushing you to answer. Okay, so if human cells have 46 chromosomes, and this, I'm going to ask you this a bunch of times, all right? How many chromosomes are present in that one cell at the end of prometaphase one? So we started with 46 chromosomes. We go through interphase, we go into meiosis one, we get to prometaphase one. How many chromosomes are present? Is it still 46? It's still 46, exactly. There's still 46, because remember, duplicated chromosomes are considered one chromosome. So how many chromatids are now present? Now you can say it wrong. 92, right? 92 chromatids, so 92 copies of the, the DNA. But our DNA copy number is 92, but the number of chromosomes is still 46. And yes, they're even, even if they cross over, yeah. They're kind of called non-homologous sister chromatids at that point. Okay, so now we're going to go to metaphase. All right. Now, what is normally happens during metaphase is we line up, right? And in mitosis, we lined up in a single file line. Well, we're in tetrad, so we can't line up in a single file line. So we have to line up two by two. All right. So we line the tetrads up across the middle as opposed to individual chromosomes. And this is where what Seth asked me earlier, it's completely random as to whether the mom or the dad are on the right or the left. So you could have it any way. You could have all the moms on the right and all the dads on the left, or you could have it mismatched in between. And we'll talk a little bit more about all those options in a minute. All right. So they line up two by two, not by one by one. So that's a big difference than meiosis, right? Because in, I'm sorry, in mitosis, because mitosis, they lined up one by one. All right, then what's next after metaphase? Anaphase. Anaphase one. And so what do you think we're going to separate? Are we separating sister chromatids or are we separating homologous chromosomes? Homologous chromosomes? Right, so in anaphase, the homologous chromosomes separate from each other. The mum, whole duplicated chromosome, separates from the dad, whole duplicated chromosome, even if there was crossing over. It keeps its crossover parts and it separates. That's different from mitosis as well, because in mitosis, we always separated sister chromatids. We didn't separate homologous chromosomes. All right. So at the end of metaphase one, how many chromosomes are present in the cell? Two. Well, in a human cell. Forty-six. Good. And how many chromatids? Two. 
92. 92, good. So we haven't changed anything yet. All right, now we're going to do the part where maybe we're changing the numbers, right? So here's telophase 1. Just like telophase in mitosis, we're going to actually pull the chromosomes to their poles, and we're going to reform new nuclear envelopes, and we're going to do cytokinesis, right, and form two new cells. Right now, these new cells are haploid, one of each kind, one long, one short, one long, one short. But the chromosomes are still duplicated, so we're not done yet. Each of these cells are now going to have to undergo meiosis too. All right, so at the end of telophase and cytokinesis, how many chromosomes are in each of those new cells? Nope. Because now we've gone to haploid, right? 23 chromosomes. How many chromatids? 46. 46, yeah. And the cells are haploid or are they diploid? Haploid. They're haploid. That's right. All right. So now this is kind of what we just walked through. We started in pro, uh, I'm sorry, we started in G2 just like we would normally. We've already duplicated the chromosomes. During prophase one, we synapsed. What does synapse mean? They come together. Right, the homologous chromosomes come together. They form their tetrads. They cross over, right? So you can see here each of them crossing over. And then um, we go through prometaphase. They're going to start to align. Um, and metaphase, they line up. And then in anaphase, we separate homologous chromosomes. Notice how they have the little crossed over sections on them here. Everybody see that? And, and now this is still meiosis one because they haven't created four cells, right? Say it louder, Juan, I didn't hear you. I said all of this is still just meiosis one because they haven't created four different cells. Perfect, you're right. We've only They're created- about to create two. That's right, we're about to create two and then each of those are gonna go undergo meiosis two to get to the four. All right, now after meiosis one, we don't, the cell doesn't actually go through a full interphase. There's no G1, there's no more S. There's a slight little G2 because we still have to duplicate the centrosome again. So that part has to happen. And then we go into meiosis two. So it pretty much goes meiosis one, G2, meiosis two. All right, and meiosis two is nearly identical to mitosis. The only difference from the way that we learned it, is that in mitosis, we started with a diploid cell, we ended with genetically identical diploid cells. In meiosis two, we're starting with a haploid cell, and we're gonna end with genetically identical haploid cells. Well, I'm, I'm lying. We're gonna end with haploid cells. <laughs> They're not necessarily genetically identical. So I, I made that up. All right, so it's very similar to mitosis. And the way that the PPNAT works is is identical. All right, so we go through prophase two, prometaphase two, the chromosomes condense, they, um, they find microtubules, they attach on either side of the centromeres, they start to um, tug and shift back and forth, the nuclear envelope goes away, we get to metaphase two, they're going to align. If they line up like mitosis, how are they going to align? One by one or two by two? One by one, exactly right. They're going to line up one by one. And then in anaphase two, we're going to separate. What are we separating? The chromatids. chromatids. The chromatids, exactly. Just like mitosis. And then in telophase two, we separate it. And now we get those four haploid cells. Everybody see how we did that? We got to those four haploid cells. So at the end of telophase two, how many chromosomes are present in, in each cell? 20 chromosomes present. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, after telophase two, how many chromosomes are present in each cell? And the answer is 23. How many chromatids after telophase two? Think card. 
Is there one? I haven't seen the right answer yet. In this picture, how many chroma kids are there? Well, two. No. Oh, um, they start to be condensed. Good job, Elaine. There's none, yeah. right? Because we're unduplicated chromosomes again, just like at the end of mitosis. We didn't have any. So we're back to that unduplicated chromosomes. We don't get sister chromatids again until we get back to S, right? Sister chromatids are the result of S. Mitosis and meiosis make sure we split those up back into unduplicated chromosomes. Excellent. Okay, any questions on the phases? And I haven't made the final yet, so I can't say for sure how I'm going to ask this, but I know on the tests I've given on campus in the past, I've had a couple pictures and, and I show you a picture, like maybe I just show you this and I tell you what the starting cell is, whether the starting cell had originally four chromosomes or two chromosomes, and then I say what phase is this? And so you got to figure out, is it is it mitosis? Is it meiosis? And then is it metaphase, right? And then if is it metaphase one or is it metaphase two? So one way, the one really fabulous way to study for this is on one piece of paper, on the left-hand side, write mitosis, meiosis one, and meiosis two, and then across the top, write prophase, anaphase, metaphase, or I mean prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and draw what they look like in every category so that you can see, compare easily a metaphase in mitosis to a metaphase in meiosis start with the same number of starting chromosomes. Ivan, what's your question? So with the difference between metaphase um, two and metaphase is that there would be like four chromosomes in metaphase and only two in metaphase two? Yes, that's the difference. So that's why you would have to know the starting number of chromosomes to answer those kinds of questions. Okay. All right, so if it's vertical and with one pair, that should go with meiosis, two. It, it, you have to count how many. It's not about pairs because these, these two chromosomes aren't homologous, right? These two chromosomes are actually two different chromosomes. It had to, We started with a chromosome that had four, and now this chromosome only had, I mean, this cell only has two. So that's what tells you that it's meiosis, is the number of total chromosomes. That makes sense. So remember, when we if we go back to that picture that I told you, I think everybody should know this one, right? If we know that the starting number is two n equals four, if it were mitosis, each of these cells would have four, right? If it's meiosis, then you're going to have half the number, half the number. Okay, does that make sense? All right. It's one of those things you probably are going to, I really, really, really recommend you making that table that I just told you about. So have three rows, mitosis, meiosis one, meiosis two, and then five columns, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and draw from the same starting cell, like maybe 2n equals 4, what it looks like in each of those cases for each each phase, and that will really start to um, allow you to start to see those differences. And then once you've done that, challenge yourself and do it again with a cell that's 2n equals 6. See if you can do it. It's a lot more chromosomes, but that's a good way to challenge yourself to see if you can do it again with another chromosome number. Okay, any questions? All right, so like we mentioned before, meiosis has the chromosome number and then um, introduces variation. And there are basically three different um, ways that variation gets introduced. So we're going to talk about them. Um, a, a independent assortment, random fertilization, and crossing over. So let's first talk about independent assortment. Independent assortment happens at metaphase one. So think about metaphase one in your head. 
So it's meiosis one. Metaphase means they line up in the middle. What's lining up? Are they lining up in a single file line or two by two? Two by two, good. So they're lining up two by two. So the way they line up two by two is completely random. So there's an equal probability of the mom facing one side or the dad's facing one side for every single pair of chromosomes. And so you can figure out the, the total number of possible combinations by just going two to the n, where n is your haploid number of chromosomes. So if you had a cell that was 2n equals 6, how many pairs of chromosomes do you have? So when it's 2n, you're going to have six total chromosomes, but three pairs. So you know, two long, two mediums, two shorts, right? So our haploid number is three. So if you do two to the third, that gives you eight possible combinations that you could have them lined up. So let's look at that, all right? So here's my original starting cell with six, all right? With six chromosomes. Two long, two medium, two short. Now we could, one way we could line them all up is all the mums on one side, all the dads on the other side. If it were to line, and this is totally possible that it could be like that. The resulting cells would have all, this one would have all dads, and this one would have all mums, right? You could line it up like this, where chromosome one and two for dad are on the top, but for the third chromosome, dad's on the bottom. You can see how the resulting cells are a little different than these original cells up here. Everybody see how they're different? Yeah. Or we could line them up like this, mum on the bottom for one, on the top for two, on the bottom for three. Oh my gosh, another combination of possible chromosomes. And then we can do it even differently, do it this way, and we get a different combination of chromosomes. So we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible ways to organize these chromosomes, right? And so you can imagine if we did this in humans, What's our N? In humans, well, what's the N? It's 23. It's 23. So if you do 2 to the 23rd, that actually ends up being about 8 million different possible ways those chromosomes could align. 8 million. So this is why you don't look just like your, your brother or your sister. When dad donated the sperm, you were one of 8 million different combinations that could have been made on that day that that sperm was created. That's craziness, right? Okay. Um, so think about what that really means in terms of separation of alleles, right? So if, if um, one parent has this allele and the other parent has that allele and you separate them, depending on where you put them, you're going to have different combinations of those alleles, all right? All right, now this um, is then even further um, diversified when you think about fertilization, because we don't really know which one of those 8 million sperm are going to fertilize which one of those 8 million possible eggs from that individual, right? So it's, there's a random chance that any one of those 8 million sperm could fertilize any one of those 8 million eggs, right? So there's really, for one couple, there's about 70 trillion genetically unique individuals that could come about from just one mom and dad. And this is really an underestimate because this does not take into consideration that whole idea of crossing over, which introduces even new shuffling of those traits, right? So meiosis really does allow for us to have variation among organisms, right, among the, the, the offspring. And this is with without mutation. These are not mutations that are causing this variation. This is just, I mean, what mom and dad originally gave you, but combining those features together between mom and dad in unique ways. Yeah? Crazy? Are you like, oh my gosh, that's so crazy? Okay, good. <laughs> That's the answer I wanted. Now, when it comes to twins, um, 
The reason why identical twins look so much alike is because they are the result of one sperm and one egg making one zygote, which is that um, fertilized egg, okay? And then that splits into two. And this one grows into one kid, this one grows into the other kid, and they're identical because they came from that same sperm and egg. Fraternal twins are the result of basically the mom ovulating more than one egg. So she ovulates two eggs. The sperm are just hungry for eggs, so a sperm finds each of them. Each of them then become fertilized eggs and grow into individuals. Fraternal twins are no more similar than any other brother-sister pair. They're just as different or the same as any other brother-sister pair, um, except for they're born on the same day. I have twin niece and nephews, and they look nothing alike at all. Totally different. Okay, uh, let's just answer this question. Which below is not a way that meiosis increases genetic diversity? Which is a way that we are not increasing genetic diversity. Good. Doubling chromosome number. Excellent. Excellent. You guys are on it. All right. So just reminding you that that crossing over still happens and introduces even more genetic diversity. All right. So if we're comparing mitosis and meiosis, the sequence of PPMAT is the same. We go through one round of interphase. We go through one round of DNA replication. What's unique to meiosis is that we, we pair the chromosomes in homologous pairs and we divide them twice. We do PPMAT twice. And we do crossing over, I forgot that one, sorry. All right, so what's the outcome? In mitosis, we get two genetically identical offspring. In meiosis, we get four genetically unique that are haploid. Now in humans, this is a like a terminal process. When you get to meiosis, the cells that make sperm, they are just sperm until they fertilize an egg. The cells that make eggs are just eggs till they get fertilized. Um, in plants, and you'll learn a little bit more about this in 1407, their, their process is a little bit differently, and it runs differently, and so you make the sperm, and then those sperm can undergo mitosis to make a multicellular organism or part of an organism that's all haploid before the sperm fertilizes the egg. So, so it's a little bit different in plants and animals. In animals, it's a terminal process. Meiosis ends and we're done. We don't do anything more with those cells except fertilization. In, in plants, we actually take those haploid cells and then just keep making more of them through the process of mitosis, which is kind of crazy. So this is a nice comparison picture between mitosis and meiosis. This is not what I want you to draw. I want you to draw it um, the other way so you can actually see metaphase next to my, metaphase two next to metaphase uh, one, right? You don't really see metaphase two here. So I want you to make sure you're making it, but this is also a good review picture to look at as well. Okay, so now we need to talk a little bit. I have like two minutes, but I think I can kind of hit the highlights of this in two minutes, and then we'll start here next class. Um, that this is how we form, form egg and sperm, all right? The process of making sperm through meiosis is called spermatogenesis. And basically, um, once you hit puberty, you are doing meiosis on a daily basis. Um, every single meiosis makes four possible sperm that can go out to fertilize eggs. And you have lots of these um, spermatogonium, which are the starting diploid cells, that can be made into sperm. All right. Um, guys, you make like two to four million of these a day. Um, maybe higher when you're a little younger. It, it decreases as you age a little bit. All right. Now, it's different in females for two things. One is that when females go through this, of the four resulting cells at the end, right here where I am at the end, only one of them is an egg that is fertilizable. So it turns out 
that the cytoplasm of an egg is extremely important. There are a lot of proteins and RNAs present in the cytoplasm that aid in those first stages of cell division after fertilization. So to make sure that we have an egg that has all of that, what happens is as meiosis goes along, the cytoplasm gets all put into one cell. And these other little cells here are literally just a nucleus with a cell membrane around it and very little cytoplasm. So all of it goes into just one of the four out, outcoming, egg, uh, outcoming cells. The other three are called um, polar bodies and they are not fertilizable. So when a woman has two eggs implanted, yes, they would come from two different oogoniums, that's right, which is that starting cell. Um, okay, the other big difference is that, um, guys, when you do meiosis, you do a new set of meiosis every day, many, many sets of meiosis every day. In girls, our meiosis starts in our ovary before we're born. So as our ovaries are developing um, in our bodies as we're a fetus, so we're still in our mom's belly, right? As they're developing then, they start meiosis. All of the eggs we're ever going to have start meiosis. And we only have about something like 300 to 500,000 possible eggs. That's it. So just think of the difference. Men make two to four million sperm a day after they hit puberty until they're like probably 80. And we only have a starting of about 300 to 500,000 eggs. And all of those start meiosis as a fetus. So when I was in my mom's belly 46 years ago, right, my ovaries started making, um, started meiosis and they get to prophase one. So they synapse, they cross over, they form their tetrad and then they sit there and they sit there in meiosis one, in, in prophase one until you hit puberty. And then once you hit puberty, the hormones will release, uh, uh, there's enough hormones to basically release one egg every 28 days. So one of those eggs is going to continue in metaphase, I'm sorry, in meiosis. They're going to get to meiosis two, and then they're going to stop again in meiosis two. They never actually finish meiosis two until they're fertilized. So for the girls in the class that have never had any children, you have never completed, or a miscarriage, you have never completed a meiosis. And meanwhile, the guys sitting right next to you are literally doing it like on high speed craziness next to you, right? So there's a big difference between meiosis in men and meiosis in, in females, all right? And that is what leads to things like Down syndrome. So we'll actually get to Down syndrome next class. Because you can imagine if you're sitting there all tangled up, like for example, I had John Keith when I was 36. I literally, my chromosomes sat tangled up for almost 37 years, right? So there was a chance that when it was came time to finish meiosis one, that they didn't want to separate from each other. They were literally tangled in a permanent way. And so if they don't untangle and they, the, the homologous pair only goes to one side, that's when you end up with things like Down syndrome. And so that's why those kinds of things increase as a woman ages because of the fact that they've been sitting um, in that, that place for so long. Okay, I am, I am done um, with chapter, well, I'm not quite done with chapter 10. I have like, like one more thing to talk about, which is Down syndrome. And so on next class, we will start genetics. Um, Ivan, you had a question. So what's the like the chance, the probability of having Down syndrome above like a uh, like regular age for when have a child? Well, we will we will look at it next time, but you can see here I have a graph right there. So the probability of having a kid with Down syndrome is very low until you hit about 35. And then once you hit 35, it increases dramatically. Okay. So by the time you're 40, it's 10% of your eggs. And by the time you're 45, like my age, it's 35% of your eggs, right, are going to be um, possible Down syndrome. And then at 50, it's super high. 
And at 50, it's super high. That's right. So by 50, it's 80% of them. So there's nice. something about the timing of that. Okay, so um, I, I posted the voiceover PowerPoint. I'll post this um, live lecture PowerPoint on YouTube, and then I'm working on the genetics one, so I'll post that one before Thursday. And I'm working on grading, too. If you have any questions, just email me. I'm trying really hard to stay up with emails, and um, over the weekend I got a little behind, but I'm catching back up. Okay? I know you went over, like, um, a grade, how to actually calculate your grade. But uh -huh. in the book online, when will that be posted? After the drop date? Um, you should be able to see a, uh, an estimate of your grade right now. I'll check in your grade book. Um, it, so there's going to be something that says lecture average and something that says lab average. And then there's going to be something that says course grade. So you can see kind no, of. I see it. I was just curious because, like, when you go on the app, you have to actually click on it. That's the only reason I was asking. I'm sorry. Oh, so the course grade is the one that's going to give you an estimate. Now, not all the grades are in yet, so that can change, right? But it's going to kind of give you where you're standing right now without the grades that haven't been put in yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, doctor. Yes. So about the uh, like the final grades for the like VOCA project, when are you gonna put them? Like in the grade book for the as soon as I grade them, but I have I'm I'm finishing the exams first, um, and then mm -hmm. I'll start on those VOCA projects projects. So as soon as I get them graded, I'll put it in there. Sure. Thank you, Doctor. Uh-huh. And about the VOCA project like, go ahead. Sure. The genetic project, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a guideline that we should follow, like, like right upon it, like follow it? There is a, a kind of an information sheet on in Blackboard that you can look at. Sure, it's thank you, Doctor. Disease project. Juan, did sure. you have another question? Yes, for the vocab project where we're doing the prefix and suffix, and it says find the term in your own words. Finding the example or the prefix or suffix. What does it say? Like if it's arrow and we just put air down, is that okay? Or do you want oh, to yeah, that's fine. And then, no, and then put an example. That's fine. Okay, okay, perfect. That's I was just thinking it can't be more difficult than that, but I felt like it wasn't enough. So I, I just no. wanted to make sure. That's that is that's okay. Specific. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. I don't want you guys to be late okay, for thanks. last. I'm go ahead and end this. Um I will see you on Thursday. Uh, Dr. Bird, I need office hour, please. Okay. Well, just stay on right now. Okay. Okay.